Hi everyone, welcome to Shakespeare Soliloquies Hamlet, Soliloquy number three, act two, scene two. Now I am alone, oh what a rogue and peasant slave am I. What I do in this series is I first provide some context for the soliloquy, and then we do a quick comprehension check to make sure you understand all of the language. And then we do a deep analysis of the language to identify important aspects of character, theme, and plot, and we look at the important literary devices as well. If you find these videos useful, please like and subscribe, and if you make a donation, you'll get a complete set of the PDFs I use in this series. See the description for details. Before Hamlet is alone, he's very much in the company of others, the traveling actors arrive and Hamlet asks them to recite a story from the Aeneid, the great Roman epic. It depicts how Pyrrhus, avenging the death of his father, kills Priam, the king of Troy. It also depicts how deeply and sincerely Priam's wife Hecuba mourned her husband's death. Now you can see how that reflects his own life. So Hamlet is enthralled with the story because of how it reflects his own life. So there's art as wish fulfillment. And not only that, but also because uh, Hamlet is an artsy, not a political kind of heroic guy uh, and he loves this kind of stuff anyway and here we see David Tennant just absolutely enthralled to the actor who's reciting the story uh, so we'll talk all about all of that today Hamlet then asks the players to perform the murder of Gonzago and to insert some original lines into the play so that he can catch the conscience of the king by observing how Claudius responds to the depiction of a brother murder on the stage okay let's do the comprehension check so now he is alone, and now he's a rogue and peasant slave, apparently. And he says, is it not monstrous that this player here, so isn't it unnatural and shocking that this mere actor in just a fiction, just imagining things out of his head in a dream of passion, could force his soul so to, to fit his own imaginings, his conceit, that from his soul's working, so from the work of his soul, his face grew pale. So he could make his face grow pale, his visage wan, merely from this, his imaginings. So tears were in his eyes. Distraction in his aspect means intense feeling in his appearance. His voice was broken and his whole function suited with the forms of his imaginings. So his whole body suited the emotion that he was imagining. And all for nothing, all for mere Hecuba, that's what, that's what he says. So he's marveling at the ability of the actor to, to, uh, to, to act, really. And we're going to talk about why that's not really all that, all that healthy, really, the way, the, way he, the way he looks at things. Anyway, so we're going to look at the literary devices here, the rhetorical questions, and the play within a play. Okay, let's look at part two. So an actor can do all that for nothing, for mere Hecuba. What's Hecuba to him or he to Hecuba that he should weep for her? Why on earth would he weep for this woman who never really even existed except in, 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 a, in an ancient Roman epic? So the narcissist then turns this, the narrative onto himself, and that's what a narcissist does, and we're going to talk about that today. So what would this actor do if he had the motive and cue for passion that I have, meaning the call to revenge that I have? So if this guy could perform this amazingly, just out of his imagination because there's a cool story in front of him. What would he do if he had a real life problem to solve like me? Well, Hamlet imagines, and this is false, and we're gonna talk about this today. Hamlet imagines that this actor would then drown the stage with tears, all this exaggeration, and he would cut open the general ear, the universal ear with horrid speech, so everyone's ears would be split wide open. He would make guilty people mad, and he would horrify the innocent people, appall the free. He would confound the ignorant, which means he would astonish and confuse people ignorant of the crime that Claudius committed, and he would amaze indeed the very faculties of eyes and ears. He would paralyze the senses of everybody. So extreme exaggeration here, a bit of narcissism, we're gonna, and there's much more to talk about as well. In particular, the literary devices, metrical variation, line break, exclamation, rhetorical question, hyperbole, and metaphor. Okay, section three. So that great actor would do all that if he had my motivation, and but I, I'm a dull and muddy, muddy spirited rascal. That's exactly what he is. I mope around, I peek, I sulk around like this John guy with his head in the clouds, which is exactly correct. I'm unpregnant of my cause. I'm not ready. I'm not reacting promptly, and I can say nothing not even for the life of a king whose kingdom and dear life was taken from him, do you see? So he, 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 he has motivation, but he can't bring himself to say anything or do something. We're going to talk about the difference between saying something and doing something, uh, which we've already talked about a little bit because the actor was not doing anything. He was really just saying something. Hamlet can't distinguish the difference. Am I a coward? So he turns it on himself and he says, am I a coward? Yeah, maybe. We're going to talk about that. And then he imagines the whole world insulting him because of this shame that he feels. And he says, who calls me villain? Who smacks me on the top of my head? Who breaks my pate across? Who plucks off my beard and blows it in my face? That was an old insult back in those days. Who tweaks 
tweaks me by the nose. There was an old insult. Who gives me the lie in the throat is deepest to the lungs. Now, that was an old proverb, and it meant who accuses me of lying uh, in the throat. If you lie in the throat, that's bad enough. But Hamlet doesn't. They're not accusing Hamlet of just lying in his throat, but way down deep in the lungs. So the king of all liars. So who does that to me? Ah, God's wounds. I have to take it because it must be that I am a coward. I am pigeon livered. And I lack the I lack the bile. I lack the source of anger that should motivate me, that should make this oppression bitter, that should spur me to to act. If I weren't a coward, then before this, air now, ere this, I should have fatted all of the region's vultures. I should have made all the region's vultures fat with Claudius's guts, do you see? So I should have killed Claudius. Claudius. If I weren't a coward, I would have killed Claudius already. Okay, so in this section, we'll talk about imagery, simile, rhetorical question, consonants, hyperbole, and enjambement, enjambment. Okay, section four. Oh, bloody body villain, remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindless villain, villain without natural feeling. He's, he's shaking his fist at Claudius here. Body means obscene and crude, usually having to do with sexual matters, which is significant for Hamlet's psychology, as we'll talk about. Oh, he calls to heaven's vengeance. I shall have my vengeance. Oh, then immediately after this grand call to vengeance, he says, oh, what an ass am I. Uh, to, to allow Claudius to still be alive. This is most brave. What's he doing? He's unpacking his soul with words. There's the difference between words and action, do you see? This is most brave what I'm doing here, that I, the son of a dear murdered father and king, prompted to my revenge by heaven and hell, I have all reasons in the world to do this. I'm standing here with words. I must, like a whore, unpack my heart with words and fall a-cursing like a very prostitute, a drab or like a scullion. Uh, now, the, back, back in Shakespeare's day, it was believed, it was associated, there was, there was a notion that, that women were associated with words and men were associated with action, and he sees himself here as, as a mere woman, and not just a mere woman, I use mere, of course, course in quotation marks, but the lowest of women, which would be the prostitute, uh, um, um, a whore, and a scullion, which is a very, very low servant. Okay, in this section, we'll talk about apostrophe, exclamation, internal rhyme, and consonants. Shift, line break, and metrical variation is here at number three. There's a lot going on there. Metaphor, sarcasm, irony, alliteration, and simile. And section five. Fie upon it, fa. Fi is a, an exclamation of disgust, kind of like our F word today, but maybe not as crude. Uh, about my brains, which means get to work my brains, get about it my brains. And then he, so he's, he's saying, come on, I've got to think of something. And then he, then he thinks of something. He says, hmm, I have heard that guilty creatures sitting in a play have, by the very skill of the scene, been struck so, so to the soul that immediately, very soon, they have proclaimed their crimes, their malfactions. Okay, so it's the, it's the, the old notion of, of, of a guilty person seeing a reenactment of their crime will reveal their guilt simply through their, their facial expressions and things. Because murder... Though it doesn't have a tongue, murder can speak with most miraculous organ, with a supernatural instrument. So his guilt will be revealed through, through his body gestures and things like that. So he says, I'll have these players, I'll have the actors play something like the murder of my father before mine uncle, and I'll observe my uncle's looks, and I'll tempt him, tempt him to the quick. Now, that, that's, that's a metaphor here. It's, it's I'll probe him to the most sensitive point. It's a surgical image. It's a surgical uh, metaphor, and that, that's quite revealing, too, and we'll talk about that. And if my uncle, if he, that ah, uh, that, uh, it means he, if he do blench, if he flinches, if my uncle flinches, then I'll know what I have to do. And we'll talk about exclamation, ellipsis, ellipsis is here. It means when you, you skip some words, you don't, f you don't flesh out the entire sentence. You, you leave some words out. That's ellipsis, apostrophe, personification, and metaphor. And the last section, the spirit that I've seen may be the devil. So he's imagining the ghost of his father now, who's the one that told him that Claudius was the murderer. And he has to be careful because, because back in those days, there was a belief that the devil does have power to assume a pleasing shape, the shape that you want to see. Yea, and perhaps out of my weakness and melancholy of spirit, as he is very potent with such spirits, when people are low, when they're depressed, the devil can abuse and, and, and use that weakness to abuse and to damn that person. So it's pretty smart here, actually. And it's uh, J.K. Rowling explores this in, um, in Harry Potter with the Dementors. And we're going to talk about that today. It's actually pretty cool. 
Um, and, 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 and it makes some sense, even though we might not believe in ghosts, but, but it, it makes a bit of sense. And, and well, we'll talk about it. Uh, so Hamlet says, no, 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 I can't really trust the ghost. Now, is he a coward here or is he being smart here? We'll talk about that. I have to have a reason. I have to have grounds more relative than this, than simply the voice of this ghost that came back from the dead. So I'll have reasons more convincing than my own suspicions and the ghost's words. The play is the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. And then this last little bit, we'll talk about that rhyming couplet and its significance. Okay, finally, that was a long one. Let's get into the analysis. The first thing that we notice here, of course, like at the beginning of all soliloquies, is, is Hamlet's own self-hate. So he calls himself a rogue and a peasant. There's a few other things we can pull out of that as well to extend on it because it gets pretty boring after a while. And it gets pretty boring talking about him as a thinker and not a doer as well. But we see here his snobbery. He is a snob. Hamlet's a very an unlikable character in many ways. He's likable in other ways too, and he's a sympathetic character. But he's unlikable in many ways. He, he, he is a bit of a snob. Uh, we saw already the scullion comment, the low, it's like the worst thing he can imagine being as a scullion or a peasant, somebody who's not noble, do you see? So that kind of classism, that kind of a caste system was built into English society back in those days, but Hamlet seems to have a healthy dose of it. Um, he's definitely not a man of the people, that's for sure. So we see, as I said, he's a thinker, not a doer, of course. Even the action that he admires here is fake acting, do you see? There's a bit of a twist on it in this case. It's not, it's not the straight up, he can't, he's frustrated and can't act, although it is that. The action that he's admiring here is not action at all. It's not act. It's not acting in the terms of doing. In terms of doing, it's acting in, in in terms of pretending to act. Do you see? So there's that layer of complication. You can't even distinguish the two. It's mere acting. And it's mere words. Um, that's connected to his narcissism, I think, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. But before that, the, the histrionic. Histrionic means he's got this dramatic sense of the self. He, the dramatic sense of life, and he sees his own life. He's projected into, he's projected his own life into this grand old epic that everybody knew, uh, this Roman epic, the life of kings, King, you know, Pyrrhus and Priam and, and Queen Hecuba, uh, uh, this, this great old well-known sympathetic story. He projects himself into that, and that, that suggests his histrionic personality disorder. He sees his life as this grand epic. Uh, the narcissism here uh, is, is, is reflected in his need for the attention, his jealousy of the attention that the actor gets, do you see? So everyone was watching that actor deliver that monologue, and everyone was enthralled because he was a really, really good actor. And, and what, the, what the narcissist does is that when some, look at this in your own life. Look at your group of friends. There's one guy who's getting all the attention because he's telling a funny story or something like that. Well, the narcissist among you will immediately try to di redirect attention away from the guy who's getting the attention so that they can have the attention. Even if they didn't, even if the person, even if the narcissist is not the one who can compare a story, they'll say something like, oh yeah, my sister went there. Yeah, she, and she loved it. Or my brother went there and he loved it, do you see? To just, to, just in a way to get the attention away from that other person. That's what the narcissist does. We all have a little bit of that in us. And if you're self-aware, you can kind of fight against it. But Hamlet is not self-aware. You know, he is. I argue in other places that he is. But anyway, in this case, he's not. Uh, in that regard, I'd like, you to, I'd like to draw your attention to the funeral scene uh, where, where Olivia is, is uh, being mourned by Laertes. And Laertes makes a great show uh, of his love for uh, and mourning for Ophelia by falling into the coffin, do you see? And Hamlet sees that and he bursts from his hiding place and says, you didn't love her, you're merely her brother. I loved her more because she was my lover, do you see? He needs the attention there. That's, that's a really grotesque scene, but we see a smaller version of that here too where you can't stand the fact that the actor's getting more attention than he is. Uh, we also see that he's an idealist. Uh, we've talked about that before in other videos. He idealizes the actor here in the same way that he idealizes his father and Horatio. This is the greatest guy in the world because he can, he can bring up all of this passion. Again, pretend to act. So there's that false, a false idealization of this false uh, uh, um, actor because he's, like, he's not a doer. He's a pretender. Okay, so in terms of theme, we see thought versus action. We talked about that as well. Um, this, this more or less applies to the whole soliloquy here, so keep this in mind. And through most of the soliloquies too, it's the paralysis and the frustration. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I? That's the frustration and the self-hate that comes from the inability to act, the paralysis. Uh, we see appearance versus reality. We touched on this in terms of the actor. Hamlet can't distinguish the appearance of act action, the acting, from real action, do you see? He's a really messed up guy.
Uh, projection we've talked about in terms of him projecting himself into the epic of, uh, of, of the Aeneid. He projects onto the actor a false ideal self, someone who pretends to act. So he's projecting himself onto the actor. I want to be like that guy, do you see? Uh, he sees what he wants to see. He sees a perfect model of someone who acts in the actor, which is false, uh, but he also uh, uh, wants to be that. Uh, yeah, so th there's two ways that he projects himself. He projects himself into this, and he also projects himself onto the actor. Literary devices, whenever you see rhetorical questions, a lot of uh, if syntactical use of questions throughout a monologue or throughout a poem or something like that, it suggests quite obviously a, 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 a lack of knowledge and, and, and a question for knowledge. And so we see here Hamlet, it suggests Hamlet's confusion, his muddle, his bewilderment. If you're a hero, you're supposed to know what your job is and you go and you do it, do you see? But not so Hamlet. So these rhetorical questions suggest that indecision, uh, that, that bewilderment. Uh, the play within a play, this, 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 is, th this soliloquy at the end that plays the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king, it introduces the play within a play. It, add, it adds layers, a web of complexity and confusion to Hamlet's situation. He's trapped already, and this just adds more layers to it. Interestingly, in terms of plot, it adds a fourth father revenge plot, do you see? Because the, 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 the Pyrrhus is, is avenging the death of his own father by killing King Priam, do you see? So there's, there's a fourth... Uh, uh, father revenge plot. So that's really, really clever plotting on Shakespeare's part. Okay, section two. This little bit here really reveals Hamlet's dramatic histrionic uh, uh, nature. Um, he, the exaggeration here is very uh, uh, emotional. It's very imaginative. He's an artsy kind of guy. He's an exaggerator. This kind of guy doesn't belong in, in in, in the seats of politics, do you see? Polit politicians have to be these clear, rational, cold, mechanical thinkers, do you see, if you want to make it in the realm of politics. But he, he, he's not. He, he, he's, he's a playwright at heart. Uh, I've, we've heard it said in places that, that Hamlet is close to the actual personality of Shakespeare, which may or may not be true. Um, so we see again the histrionics. Uh, he sees his life as an epic play. The cue for passion is literally a cue. So he sees himself literally as a player in an epic story, the Aeneid. I have a cue. Okay, go, hero, go. Get revenge for the death of Claudius. He sees himself in, in, that, in that regard. So there's that projection. Uh, he craves the attention that the actor gets as well. So, so we've talked about that. Uh, the, now, the exaggeration is not, doesn't just reveal his histrionic and dramatic character and his artsy kind of personality. It actually represents, it, it suggests a kind of hypocrisy, do you see? He despises lies in others. He hates it. He says many times that, you know, I, I hate the court. I'm disgusted with the court. I don't, want to have any, I don't want to have anything to do with these kinds of people. They're all hypocrites. The world is a wasteland. I hate it. Huh? Really? You're a participator in that too, buddy. And we're going to talk about that in another regard as well. He holds little regard for the truth himself. These are all lies, complete lies. And we've seen already that he lies about how long his father uh, died before the mother married. He eventually gets it down to one hour. Um, that's an exaggeration too. But, but he, 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 he convinces himself that it was only two months and then one month. Uh, but, but, uh, but Ophelia reminds us that it's been four months. So he is that kind of hypocritical exaggerator. He hates untruths and others, but he participates in it as well. Very much like Holden Caulfield from Catcher in the Rye, that great little novel. You should go back and read that because Holden Caulfield and, and Hamlet are very, very, very similar characters. Uh, he's an idealist here, so he again, he idealizes the actor, maybe a, a kind of a father figure, like he idealizes the father in Horatio, but he seems to forget that he's just, that this actor is just acting and not doing anything. So you can talk about irony in that regard as well. Uh, he's kind of passive aggressive here as well. Even when contemplating action, he preferred to think about action at, at a remove. Everybody he kills in this play, by the way, all action that he does to kill people, to remove people, are done is done at a remove. He kills Rosencrantz and Guildenstern indirectly by rewriting the, the notes to let to let England kill them. That's passive aggressive, do you see? Uh, he kills uh, he kills Polonius through the curtain. He doesn't have to look at someone in the eye, do you see? He's not that kind of murderer, which might be to his credit, is what, what I've argued too. So he he hides behind a fiction in the same way that he hides behind the curtain and he hides behind the power of England to kill Rosencrantz and Guildenstern when he's talking about action, do you see? Uh, very, very clever storytelling, uh, uh, but a very, very complex character.
Okay, so uh, we also get a little bit here. So the Hecuba, 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 that obsession with the perfect idealized vision of the, mo of the wife, mother, DC. That suggests we can put that together with, with other evidence. You, you, none of this, by the way, uh, stands on its own. Uh, take what I say in all of my videos, and then if you find it really, really interesting, dig into it because what I'm talking about here, you can find support for it in other places. And that's how you build an argument for, uh, for, for what you believe to be true about a text. So there's a bit of Oedipal complex here that suggests to me anyway, this obsessive love with the ideal mother. Now elsewhere in the play, of course, he, 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 he compares his Gertrude, his mother unfavorably to Niobe, who lost uh, her children and then cried herself to stone, do you see? Those are the ideal mothers, Niobe, epic. Epic myths, DC. There's the projection. There's the artsy person. There's a the dramatic person. Uh, sees his life in epic terms. The the histrionic personality disorder. So Hecuba, the perfect mother, is the perfect mother, and Gertrude certainly ain't. Well, he compares everybody on Earth to people who are not on Earth, and that makes people on Earth look really, really bad. Uh, there's a bit of suggestion of the wasteland here as well, the, the great chain of being. Remember, I've talked about the great chain of being many times. Uh, God is in his heaven, and he, 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 he uses the king on earth to, to send his grace to the world, do you see? And if he cut off that conduit to God's grace, then, then the wasteland, it, the world becomes a wasteland because there is no grace, there is no goodness in the world. So we see here the, the cue for passion involves not just his own father revenge. It's not a personal family. It's the king. The king has been removed from the system. The world has thus become a wasteland, and he has this grand cue for passion, a grand cue for action uh, to, to heal that wasteland. So it, it happens, but it's also at a personal father-son level as well. So so the wasteland occurs usually in, in most of the good stories at, at all these different levels. The micro level of the personal, the psychological level, Hamlet has to overcome his own personal wasteland, which is vast. The social, which is the with the political realm, do you see the the kingdom itself, and then the cosmic, because the king, the the, the conduit to God's grace has been uh, uh, removed. There are some really cool literary devices here. The first one we'll talk about is the metrical variation. Now remember, Shakespeare was writing in iambic pentameter. That means he had five of these in each line. So to tum to tum to tum to tum to tum. That's iambic pentameter. Five of those in each line. Now what a good poem will do, of course, what a good poet will do is they'll they'll choose whatever meter they they think is appropriate to their subject matter, but then there'll, there'll be variation all throughout it. So when I was first studying Shakespeare, I sometimes found it really hard to pick out these iams because a lot of lines aren't iambic necessarily, or there's, there's very often a vi variation. So keep reading, keep reading through it. If you can't find one easily, you'll, you'll eventually bump into a line that actually is quite easy to, to identify the iambic pentameter. And this is one of those, that he should weep for her, what would he do? Very, very clear. It's, it's, you could read that, exaggerate the, the beats, and you'll see it. Now here, of course, there's two, these two lines are, are, are varied. They're not iambic pentameter. They're iams, but they're, but they're different kind, they're different count of iams. For Hecuba, there's only two beats there. What's Hecuba to him or he to Hecuba? There's six, do you see? So why that variation? That's not an accident. In, a, in, in the hands of a genius, a, a good engineer of language shouldn't be putting these things in there by accident. If you're in the hands of a good poet, you can dig into it and see, okay, why? Why the variation? Uh, well, here, it's a line break as well. There's, there's a line break here. It should be five, but it's not. And there's an extension here. So the variation in the line lengths, we can talk about it as line break as well. And then, of course, the repetition of Hecuba, 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 which we've already talked about. So all of that, that metrical variation and the line breaks and the repetition points to Hamlet's astonishment and obsession with his ideal image of woman. So he can't believe uh, that that that's that the actor can call up this simply for his imagined Hecuba DC. That's part of it. So there's the, there's the astonishment. But also, as we've talked about, his obsession with the ideal image of woman, which is Hecuba, the, the perfect woman in, in, in sharp contrast to Gertrude, who is definitely not, and poor Ophelia, who isn't either for reasons beyond, beyond her imagining. Okay, so literary device exclamations, uh, they point to Hamlet's immaturity, this wide-eyed, childlike attitude to the world. Look at them, all these exclamations. It's like, oh my goodness, how can this actor do this? How on earth can an actor act? Do you see how stupid that is? Do you see how childish that is? It's like he's, it's like he's a, a three-year-old looking at a birthday cake 
and noticing it as a cake for the first time in his short life. Do you see? It's like, oh my goodness, a cake. It's all chocolate and it's for me. Uh, He's very, very immature in that regard. There's a disconnect with, with real life. How on earth could this guy be king if he marvels at everything in his kingdom? Do you see? A a, a politician is somehow kind of cold-hearted because they go through life and they see these things and they just, yeah, this is the way the world is. Why would I get excited about it? I'm just going to use the world for my purposes. That's what a Machiavellian ruler would do. So there's a constant amazement at this common phenomenon. Rhetorical questions, as we've already talked about, suggest Hamlet's confusion, his muddle, his bewilderment, his his indecisiveness, his callowness. That's what callowness means. It's this wide-eyed, childlike attitude towards the world, this inexperience, this naivete. The wrong man for the job, for the king job, for sure. Hyperbole, as we've talked about, suggests a dramatic histrionic personality. Uh, It also suggests his hypocrisy, as we've talked about, his unconcern for truth, think of it in those terms, while demanding the truth from others. There's the Holden Caulfield aspect. It also suggests the, the universal nature of Hamlet's wasteland, the great chain of being. So that hyperbole, we can pick that out right here, I think, the general ear. The whole world will be turned upside down if I were able to act like this, or if this actor had the cue for passion that I have, or if anybody could act the way that, way that I would, the whole world would react. So there's a telescoping out, not just the micro level of the personal father-son relationship, but a microscoping, uh, sorry, telescoping out to the broader picture, which is the whole world, and that suggests the great chain of being. Now, he ends here with, the, with the, this section, with the, with the metaphor of the cleaving of the ear, and that perhaps suggests a bit of that pent-up violence in Hamlet, that frustrated shadow. He wants to act, but he can't. He wants to let his aggressive side out, but his aggressive side, his shadow, is trapped within this cage of his indecision and, and perhaps cowardice. That's, that's, that's not established yet, but that's, po- that's, a very possi- that's, a, that's very, very possible. Okay, uh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Section three. More self hate, of course. He knows that he lacks courage. He knows that he's a John of Dreams. He knows that he's mutty spirited, muddy spirited. He's a rascal. So, more of that self hate. Uh, he's a thinker, not the doer. He's unpregnant of his cause. He can't act. He doesn't act quickly enough. Histrionic, again, he sees his life as this grand drama, the same kind of thing. Now, here, here's a little twist, though. This, this narcissism here is, 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 is kind of interesting. He imagines people care enough about him to insult him. Who calls me villain? Who breaks my, my pate across? Who plucks off my beard? You see, uh, you have to be special. If somebody's going to pick on you, you have to be at least noteworthy for them to pay attention to you, DC. And so that, that's a narcissistic thought as well to think that everybody's making fun of him when maybe they don't even care about him, DC. Um, thought versus action here, we can see this as well. We've talked a little bit about the difference between saying th- something and doing something. Uh, in this case, however, it's kind of interesting because the words here actually equal the action. He should claim the right to the throne that itself would be an act the mere act of speaking would not just be like the actor whose words are empty because this all pretend it's a fantasy no in this case here that hamlet the fact that he can't say anything also means that he can't do anything because the, the the saying of it would be an acting so hamlet wants to and should declare his own right to the throne as well as claudius's crime so he should declare claudius's crime claudius's crime but he's not quite sure of that yet so he can't Uh, He should also could now I put and should with a question mark here because we don't know the political situation. If Claudius, for example, has control of the army, if his best buddies are the general in the army, Hamlet has to shut up. Do you see? Isn't it interesting that that Shakespeare didn't put that in the that kind of information into the play? We really don't know. It leaves it a mystery of of, uh, we, we. It makes it harder for us to judge Hamlet harshly or positively in this regard but if we knew that his best friends that claudius's best friends were the generals we would understand uh, uh the reason why uh hamlet can't say anything he wouldn't be a coward in that regard dc so it's really quite interesting uh in terms of literary devices here we have the imagery suggests a poor self-image he's a tarnished Tarnished means it's dirty, it's old, it's rusty, that kind of thing. So he's, 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 a, he's a muddy, muddy metaled rascal. Do you see his spirit uh, is, is tarnished? His ideas are unclear. So there's the self-hate, uncertain, lacking conviction and direction. Now there's a simile here, the, the John of dreams. I am like John of dreams. Of course, I'm like this guy who doesn't do anything in the world. He just had his head in the clouds all the time, an artsy dreamer, which is actually true. Rhetorical questions, again, the same kind of thing, suggest Hamlet's unheroic confusion. Again, a a hero should be decisive. Laertes is decisive. I would cut 
his throat in the church if I knew that this particular man was responsible for my father's death, says Laertes. So Hamlet is not that kind of a decisive person. He, he, he's thinking in terms of these questions. What should I do? What should I do? What should I do? Muddle, bewilderment. He's the wrong man for the job. Ch he's a child, naive, unstable sense of self. We haven't talked about that. So you can think about, the, think about Hamlet in those terms as well. He has a very unstable sense of self. He's looking to others for answers. That's what this questioning means. Now he's talking to himself, which is a part of paralysis, and he's trapped, but he's asking these questions, trying to find out wh who am I? What should I be doing, do you see? Unstable sense of self. It's quite sad. Now consonance is really cool. It's a sound device, and I've, I've explored this in other uh, videos of mine, but but this 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 is the map of English consonant sounds, and they have different qualities. They each have different qualities that reveal different meanings. So we've talked before about the fricatives, about the stridents down here. All of these sounds here, church, three, she, measure, s, z, they all kind of hiss and they're scratchy so they can be unpleasant. These ones up here are plosives. These are called plosives. The P, the B, the T, the D, the K, the G, and the button. That is actually, they're called plosives. They're called stops because what you do is you push the air out of your lungs. You use some mechanism here in your face to briefly, briefly hold the air, stop the air, and then you explode it very, very briefly. That's why they're called plosives. And of course, if you're writing a poem about a war where there's bombs and bullets flying everywhere, then you can't write a war poem without plosives because things are exploding, DC. So they naturally express some kind of violence or some kind of excitement anyway, DC. The p, p, b, b, t, t, t. Do it. Exaggerate the sounds and you can feel it. It's really cool, by the way. It's really cool. If you want to know your language, explore those consonants and, 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 and the assonants, the vowels, but the consonants are really easy to get a hold of. Anyway, so we do see the K, the P, and the B here, and what would they, the plosive sounds? Who calls me villain, breaks my pate across, plucks off my beard, and blows it in my face? If you exaggerate the sounds like that, or even just look at all the Bs and the Ps, then you can see that there's a, there's a pent-up violence in these lines, do you see? And that's what a good poet does. Um, if there's a lot of bad poetry out there that can't do this, the poet can't do this, but you're in the hands of a master when they know how the mechanics, it's engineering. A good poem is an engine is like, like a, like a, like a BMW engine. It's, it's engineered as brilliantly as that. And this is the way Ham, this is the way Shakespeare was able to write. Uh, the hyperbole, uh, which hyperbole? The hyperbole suggests, yes, this whole thing is, is, is hyperbole and it suggests Hamlet's narcissism. Oh no. Yeah. The, the lies here. Um, yeah, look at this. This this is a cool one. Uh, who calls me a liar? Who calls me villain? Breaks me, breaks me, breaks me, breaks me, breaks me yes, as deep, who gives me the lie in the throat as deep as to the lungs? Do you see? Even in the insults that people give me, it's hyperbolic. And if you think that I'm not just a liar, they're not just calling me a liar. They're calling me the best liar in the world. Do you see? If people think I lie, they must think that I'm the deepest liar down into my lungs, which suggests a, a narcissistic view of the self that you're the best in the world. All these little subtle ways that people reveal their weaknesses. And in real life, we do this too. As you get older, you start to notice this stuff. As you get older, and if you read a lot of literature you, you, and, and, and psychologically analyze it, you see this in yourself and you see it in other people as well. It's really, really interesting. Now, we've talked before about line break and enjambment. Enjambment is when you cut the line where it doesn't naturally deserve to be cut. And that's number six here. So the natural completion of this line is, ah, God's wounds, I should take it. I have to take this because it cannot be except I am a coward. It can't be except that I am pigeon livered. That's what the line should be. But Shakespeare cuts the line at B and what that creates is it creates a couple of different things. Now Enjambment line breaks do a few things and these are just my notes on them but, but look them up and they can do even more. If you cut a line like that it can add stress on the on the words that's left hanging out on its own kind of briefly. So there's stress on that word. There's also stress on the word that you crash down on on the, on the next line because you're anticipating it. Uh, it can quicken the pace because you're forced to read more quickly. Uh, it can add violence to the line. Uh, Sylvia Plath, uh, her, her, her poetry is quite disturbed, and she used line breaks and uh, enjambment to create a sense of violence. These broken, torn lines are quite tragic in someone like Sylvia Plath. Uh, it can also add ambiguities, and we see that in Wordsworth here. You can have a look at that on your own. But in, in Shakespeare here, it's the same thing that Wordsworth does. It creates ambiguity. Once you read to this line, you got a meaning in your head. Okay, it cannot be. God's wounds, that I should take it. It can't be. Do you see? 
One meaning is it simply can't be true. But then when you complete the idea on the next line, oh, okay, I see, you get a second meaning. So, so, so very often poets, again, master engineers, will do that and they'll create that double meaning on purpose. And I think it, both, I think, I think it works in both cases here. So the, that, that un- enjambment creates that shock and disbelief. It can't be true. It cannot be that I'm, I'm, I'm this cowardly. But then he finishes the idea and says, yes, it can't be, th- but that I'm a coward. Okay, uh, next section. So a few familiar character elements and plot elements, uh, uh, theme elements here. We see the self-hate return. He calls himself an ass. We see the snobbery return, as we've talked about. He sees the lowest form that he can imagine being would be another human being, a scullion, a low-level worker, or a prostitute, even worse, do you see? So there's the snobbery. Uh, we see in, in the prostitute image, we see his, his obsession with sexuality. And again, it's not just here. You use this as an anchor point, but then go out to the rest of the play and find other evidence to support this thesis, and it's very, very simple. Uh, he can't stand the idea of Claudius having sex with his, his mother, um, and he projects that that disgust onto uh, for his mother onto a uh, uh, poor Ophelia as well. We see him as a thinker, not a doer. As we've talked about, uh, women were associated in Shakespeare's time uh, with words, men with deeds, and the worst kind of women uh, would be dealers in words uh, as prostitutes, do you see? Uh, uh, words here equal inaction. We've just seen previously uh, uh, in this video that words could actually be action, you know, declare your right to the throne, declare Claudius's guilt. That would be an act. But here we see w- w- with the image of the prostitutes, the whores, uh, uh, as just mere empty, grotesque words, do you see? Uh, we've talked, we, we've we hinted at this, do you see? The mind-body duality, Hamlet's association with the body, uh, of the body with vileness, anything low. He can't stand that lowness. He wants to live in this Apollonian, the realm of Hyperion, the sun god. He wants to live in that realm. Uh, he can't stand having a body. So he projects that disgust uh, onto other people, especially with his mother. He dis- He projects his disgust of his mother's sexuality onto all women, and that's extended in in a very uh, sad and disturbing, uh, the nunnery scene where he just lays into Ophelia very, very unfairly. But he's not talking to Ophelia in that scene. He's talking to his mother, of course. Uh, the revenge, the revenge plot is is mentioned again here. A declaration, as expected in a revenge plot, it's a plot mover and reminder. Oh, vengeance! It, it's a trope. It's it's a it's a genre. Remember, and so when you go to a genre play or genre movie, you expect certain things at certain times. And here we get it again. This call for revenge, and if it's a simple, a very very simple revenge plot then it would just that that would be enough but because this is Shakespeare this it's it's buried <laughs> it's buried in all of this psychological and thematic uh, content uh, the wasteland is suggested in here as I said this telescoping out from the personal problem to this global universal cosmic problem that's the wasteland great chain of being theme the cosmic disruption heaven and hell cause calls forth the hero with uh, quotation marks because he's not quite the hero um, in terms of literary devices, we see apostrophe and exclamation. Now, the apostrophe is not the is not the uh, the punctuation point. The apostrophe means you, when you talk to someone, then something or someone that is not there. So, for example, oh pen, you are my best friend. So the pen can't understand me, but that's an apostrophe. It's a poetic it's a poetic trope. So uh, he's talking to Claudius, who is not in the room, of course. He says, oh, you body villain, you remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindless villain. So he's talking to Claudius here. And, of course, that suggests his anger and obs- his obsession with Claudius. And we can, th- we can ask ourselves again. We're, 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 trying to, we're trying to establish that, sh- that Hamlet has this obsession with sex, this sexual repression, uh, perhaps. Uh, and so you can ask yourself, why, why lecherous? If he's if he's the hero to call the if he's the hero called upon to heal the wasteland of the king being murdered, then all he should be concerned about is the murder. But the fact that he can't stand the fact that Claudius is enjoying a physical life, do you see? Whereas Hamlet, the repressed guy, can't. Um, that's a bit of a stretch, but you could find evidence for it throughout the play, as as I've mentioned before, and especially his mother. He can't he can't he can't abide the thought of his mother having sex with uh, with anybody but the father. Probably not even with the father, to be honest, because there's an an Oedipal entanglement entanglement here for sure. Uh, internal rhyme and consonants uh, on strident hissing s's and growling r's convey Hamlet's disgust and venomous anger. Again, if you're keen to literature, if you're sorry, if you're keen to language, to the sound impact of language, you can hear these things not just in poetry but in real life by the way these things the the greatest things that your friends say really good jokes or really good uh, 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 expressions they do have this kind of poetic quality to them as well remorseless so ours tend to growl you see 
Lots of R's, R's, R, R, lots of R's. Remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindless, v villain. We could add the, the, the strident V's in there, do you see? Body, villain, the plosives B's, do you see? And the, and the strident V's, all this hissiness. So that creates that, uh, that absolute disgust, this venomous anger. Uh, now he shifts. There, 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 there's a shift, a line break, and metrical variation, as we've talked about metrical variation already, at the line O vengeance. That's not iambic pentameter at all. It's left alone on its own line, and it rings out all this empty space. When the, when, the, when the actor says it, there should be a little pause. If it's a poem on a page, you see that empty space, and you react to that, you react to that empty space. With a, it, it resonates. This line will resonate. Do you see? This short line will resonate. So that shift, he, it, that, that line break and metrical variation, tr uh, attempt to shift the focus away from Hamlet's obsession with, with, with thinking and thoughts and words and everything, but it doesn't work. If this were Laertes, Laertes would say, oh, vengeance, let's go, where's my guy? That would be Laertes, you see, but not so Hamlet. He tries to shift the focus of his mental thoughts, but then it just goes right back to, oh, what an ass am I? <laughs> Do you see, he can't handle it. He can't do it at all. Laertes would be such a different character. Okay, so uh, the spondy versus the iamb at O vengeance indicates Hamlet's determination to act, uh, but actually delay, because that's what he does, at least to confirm the, confirm the ghost's claim when he comes up with the play as a thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. And this, as I mentioned, that, that, that line, O vengeance, is a reminder of the, of, the, of the revenge genre. Now, just to go back to the spondy thing, the spondies would be something like this, tum, 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 tum. That's much more dramatic versus the ta tum, ta tum, ta tum, ta tum, ta tum, ta tum of the iamb. So this one here, O vengeance, O vengeance, O vengeance, O vengeance, do you see? So there's, there's, there's two hard beats at the beginning here, and that suggests the power and the force behind that, uh, that, that uh, the, the, the words itself. Oh, vengeance, I have to get revenge. But of course he blows it. Uh, the metaphor of the ass, of course, indicates Hamlet's self-hate, his disgust with the lower things. An ass is a donkey, it's a kind of mule. Again, it's a subhuman thing, and he sees himself as a, a subhuman. And his own disgust, he doesn't see any nobility in the, in the, in the ass and the donkey whatsoever, which does a good job for us humans. Do you see, he sees this disgust with lower things, this mind-body duality. He wants to live in the Apollonian, Hyperion realm of the mind. Uh, the sarcasm and the irony suggests Hamlet's self-disgust. It shows a contrast between what Hamlet wants to be and what he is. So the sarcasm here is number five. He says, oh, this is most brave. Look at me unpacking my words like a whore. This is most brave, he says. So there's that sarcasm and that sense of irony and that, that, that bravery, the word brave injected into the, into the dialogue uh, is a reminder that he's not. So it's a contrast that, that he's not what he wants to be. We get some more sound devices here in the glottal H's, the alliteration. Now H comes from, from down here, so it's low in the throat, so it's guttural, it's low, and Hamlet hates low things as we've seen, so that indicates his disgust, and it also hisses. It's a, it's a fricative. It's, it, 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 it hisses, and so that conveys a bit of his bitterness. So where do we see that? That's number six. Oh, heaven and hell, must I, like a whore, unpack my heart with words, do you see? So there's that, that kind of hissiness as well. Uh, the simile, by comparing himself to a prostitute, so I, like a whore, I must unpack my words, uh, my heart with words. By comparing himself to a prostitute, Hamlet conveys his inability to act, so prostitutes, women, generally were, were, were associated with words and not action. And, of course, as we've talked about, his puritanical disgust with the body, with women generally, female sexuality, with sex generally. And, of course, there's his mind-body duality problem, that, uh, that, that sexual repression that, that's that's quite evident in Hamlet's character. So finally, Hamlet does manage the shift away from his own thoughts and into something resembling action here. He comes up, this is where he comes up with a plan, do you see, to catch the conscience of the king. So he says, fie, fie upon it all, about my brains. Hmm, I have heard the guilty creature sitting in a play will reveal themselves. So here's, he, he's finally coming around to some kind of action. So we see him here as being smart. Now, the big question is whether or not he's cowardly. He calls himself a coward. Uh, he, he delays and delays and delays, which suggests the cowardice, do you see? But, but, but no, you have to look at the other side of it. Yeah, he, he, he can't can't speak up. Maybe Claudius has the generals of the nation in his pocket, DC, so he would be thrown in prison and killed. So maybe it was wiser not to say anything. And, and here we see that the, the ghost could be uh, uh, lying to him and tricking him. So he's got to come up with a test. 
do you see? So it's actually pretty smart. Not necessarily cowardly. The ghost might may indeed be the devil. Uh, coward, thinker, not a doer. Is this ploy merely a delay tactic? Yes, as we've talked about. It is both of these things. Now we see him here as a hypocrite. This is more evidence of his hypocrisy, do you see? So he, remember, we talked about him being a Hold, uh, Holden Caulfield kind of guy who despises the cunning deceptions of everybody else and yet willingly engages in them, do you see? And yet he's a cunning deceiver himself. So he hates the cunning deceptions of the court and yet here he is. He's doing one of the, the, the most complex of all deceptions, do you see? Uh, that leads into these two themes as well, the meddling theme, the parental interference and the meddling theme. Everyone in this wasteland, we could, we could attach the wasteland theme to this as well, uh, including Hamlet, is manipulating everybody else. Everybody at all levels are manipulating everybody. Now, the hero is the one who's supposed to stand outside of that. If you go back, back and watch the original Matrix, uh, Neo is the guy that stands outside. Everybody's participating in life willingly. They're not really caring about it, but all of a sudden he gets this calling of the hero who, and he sees the world for this weirdness that it is, and he recognizes that it's a wasteland and it's not the way it should be. That's what Hamlet should be, but he's not. He Instead, he gets the calling that the world is not the way it should be, but in order to correct it, he's got to participate in the corruption of it, DC, by being a deceiver, by putting on an antic disposition for another thing, DC. So it's see how complex it is? It's really kind of cool. Um, so the world of real, here's, here's Hamlet trying to participate in the world of real politic. He looks at it and says, okay, smiling villain, smiling villain, as if this, if this is the way the world works, I got to play this game, you see. So Hamlet is trying to play Claudius's Machiavellian game. He doesn't do it very well at all. Uh, literary devices, the exclamation again suggests an agitation of frustration. And also we can tack onto this, this revulsion, do you see? Fie, fie upon it, fie. He's disgusted with, with the whole mess of things, including the sexuality, as we've talked about. Um, the ellipsis. Now, ellipsis is when you, when, you, when you ignore or you leave out certain words because you assume that they will be understood by the audience. And what we see here is a, about my brains. Now, a full sentence would, would read something like, go about it, my brains, or let's get at it, my brains, let's go, do you see? Uh, that's also an apostrophe because he's talking to his brains here, do you see? So that ellipsis itself, it indicates a kind of agitation, a racing manic thoughts. I've talked in other places about uh, syntax, fragmented speech. Not so much in this one, I think, in my previous video. Fragmented speech indicates that kind of the, the racing manic thoughts, the agitation. Uh, now, if you compare that, again, I've, in my last video I said that we have to understand main characters in terms of the subsidiary characters in a play. And Laertes is a man of, 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 of uh, not few words, because when he talks to Ophelia, he, he uses too many words. But, but when the time, when the crunch comes, what would you do if you knew somebody killed your father? I would cut his throat in a church, says the hero, do you see? That's how a hero is supposed to react. Uh, but, but Hamlet is not that kind of cool-headed guy, and that response suggests that he's not, do you see? The, the exclamations and the out about my brains. Um, okay, so the apostrophe here to his brain implies that the play will be a battle of wits. Now that's and that's kind of cool too, do you see? Uh, and something like John Wick. John Wick was the, uh, the the ultimate modern version of the of the revenge plot, uh, and it's fairly straightforward. He he gets he gets at the beginning of the play. There's a reason for him to get revenge, and he goes about the play. Most of the most of the most of the the, the, the movie is the action part, which is really really cool too. But a really good uh, a, 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 a really good revenge movie or plot, it will, won't just be the action, which Hamlet has it as well. At the end, there's a great sword fight scene and there's lots of tension, John Wickish kind of tension at the end of this. Shakespeare loved that kind of stuff, by the way. Uh, but added to that, there has to be a battle of wits, which makes it a lot more delicious when the hero finally uh, gets his revenge. Uh, so the revenge plot, uh, move a reminder. Yes, and then the, the battle of wits will be this. Look what he says here. He says, about my brains. Okay, so here's the hero. Here's the John Wick character saying, okay, how how am I going to approach this? Okay, I got it, do you see? So there's that, that. It's a genre moment. It's a genre plot mover reminder pushing the, the plot forward. Uh, the personification of murder as having the ability to speak contrasts with Hamlet's inability to speak, to claim that his rightful throne. So he says, murder, though doesn't have a tongue, like I don't have a tongue, metaphorically speaking, do you see? Murder will speak, even though I don't speak, so I'll let murder speak for me. So that, that's, that's kind of clever. Uh, the metaphor of the, this is cool too, the metaphor of the surgery, the tent, I will tent him to the quick. I'll tent him to the quick. I'll observe Claudius and I'll tent him to the quick means I'll surgically 
analyze and break apart what's in him. So the metaphor suggests a cutting precision of thought. So he's going to he's going to pierce through to the heart of Claudius. It also, because it's a surgery metaphor, it suggests a disease that the wasteland is is, is in need of a cure. You see, the Denmark is in need of a cure, uh, and it it also adds a nasty element uh, um, aspect to this whole thing as well. The the pleasure that Hamlet will have cutting open Claudius, which is understandable given the circumstances, uh, but it's still it's still pretty cutting. Here we see a repetition of some of the themes and character elements we've already talked about. So Hamlet's pretty smart here, DC. He says that the, the spirit I've seen may be the devil, and the devil has power to assume a pleasing shape. So is that cowardice that he's that he's going to delay the murder? No, not necessarily. So we've talked about that already. This is kind of cool too. So so as I've mentioned at the beginning of this video, that that Hamlet's aware that the devil might be playing on my melancholy, on my depression, DC. And that's that's what that's the Dementors. The Dementors are able to prey on Harry Potter uh, because Harry Potter has ha has experienced uh, a death in his life, DC, and so he's vulnerable to these evil spirits uh, of depression. Uh, it's interesting how how that uh, that personification and Hamlet's uh, the the ghost as 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 a Dementor, the father as a Dementor. Oh my goodness, I just thought of that. That's even more tragic, DC. And it's, it's actually, yeah, there's some truth to it as well. The father is the tyrant, Dementor. Oh, oh, so, so complex. Anyway, cool stuff, cool stuff. Uh, so we see again, uh, the thinker, not the doer. Is this merely a rationalization, a delay tactic? Yes, it's both that. It's both him being smart and an overthinker uh, and a good thinker, but also an overthinker. Uh, the hypocrite, now he despises cunning deceptions of the court, but he's a cunning dece deceiver himself. The play is the thing where I'll, where I'll catch the conscience of the king. He's almost gleeful here as saying, ah, I got a plan, now I got a plan. Well, here he is being one of these deceivers. So there's the hypocrisy. The meddling theme, everybody's meddling. The devil may be meddling with us. My father from beyond the grave is meddling with my life, do you see? Now there's a total, total wasteland. Everybody's toying with everybody else. The wasteland, even the hero is corrupt. I'm going to participate in this, these kinds of deceptions. So there's the wasteland too. Machiavellianism, same theme. Hamlet is trying to play Claudius' manipulation game. Not very, very, very well. Um, so this last part here, uh, it's called uh, uh, the, the, a rhyming couplet when two lines uh, end with an end rhyme like this. And it was usually used... Uh, it, it creates a sense of finality to close out sections. Shakespeare used it to do that, uh, or scenes, or important statements, not just at the end of scenes, but at the end of important statements, uh, Shakespeare would do that. It creates a resonance, a sense of grandeur for important ideas and statements, and that, that rings in our ears as a finally, after all of the stuff that we've seen so far, now we have the guy ready to take some action. Do you see the plays, the thing, we're in, I'll catch the conscience of the king, and then the hero anti-hero runs off the stage and so the audience is ready for okay what's the next chapter in this story all right let's wrap it up with a little bit of context post speaking of the wasteland here we go so following hamlet's declaration that he will manipulate the players the actors in order to manipulate claudius the scene shifts to claudius gertrude and polonius manipulating poor old rosencrantz and guildenstern in order to manipulate hamlet do you see so worse, Claudius and Polonius then plot to manipulate Ophelia to manipulate Hamlet by secretly observing the, ex the encounter between the exchanged lo estranged lovers. And that's the great nunnery scene. So a total mess. Something's rotten in the state of Denmark for sure. Parental interference here at its worst. Manipulations, deceptions, betrayals of trust. That is a tragedy, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so that's the end of Shakespeare's Soliloquies, Hamlet's Soliloquy number three. Thanks for watching. I hope you found it useful. And if you did, please like and subscribe. And don't forget to pick up a copy of the PDFs if you need them.